concerning the law, I can only acquaint you with the law and leave you to your choice and its risk. But we have kept before it, tell it, regardless of what they do with the law. In the 18th chapter of the book of Matthew, we read these words. If any two of you agree on earth about any request that you must make, that request will be granted by my Heavenly Father. Find two who agree. And that request will be granted. Well, can you conceive of something greater? If two agree on earth concerning any request, it doesn't have to be good, doesn't have to be this, that, or the other, but any request that you must make that request will be granted by my Heavenly Father. Here we are told the greatest secret in the world concerning the human imagination. We are told that with God all things are possible. Then we are told all things are possible to him who believes. So he equates God with the human imagination. That God is the human imagination. And all things are possible to the human imagination. Now, a friend of mine called me today. And I tell you the story that you may see. It's entirely up to you. I'm quite sure that she was perfectly innocent in the wonderful work that she did. She's exercised this talent of hers, which she learned, as you have, from this platform. And she has done a remarkable job in the world of Caesar, in dollars and cents. But one has to learn something outside of this and govern everything by love. Everything must be governed by love. And she was quite concerned, really quite disturbed. You never know, what have I done? Have I done something that is wrong? A neighbor of mine, a male neighbor, asked me if I would play back his record for him. So let me explain to you what she means by this. She has a very keen ear. If you speak to her, make a sentence, and then you stop. She can hear you as distinctly as anyone could ever hear you. If you put it on a record, what she is hearing is just as accurate as that recorded record. So, she wants you to make a statement in a positive manner. Like the great professor who said, I have a lavish, steady, dependable income, consistent with integrity and mutual benefit. This he said long before he had a nickel, and he persuaded himself of the reality of what he was hearing. So she wants you to put it into a positive statement just like that. So tell me what you want. For well, the neighbor wanted to be free of a disturbing element in the neighborhood, which was also a neighbor. A, a, a couple with three children. And so, 
she heard him distinctly say that he was free of this disturbance, that they were gone. Her ability to hear distinctly is so keen, so wonderful, that she heard him affirm what he had affirmed. In a matter of days, the parents were killed on the highway, leaving three children, two little ones, and a demented boy in his early teens. So she wondered, what did I do? Well, I tried to persuade her, you did nothing that was wrong. You simply exercised a principle. The lad who asked of you, did you ask him anything concerning his motive behind it all? Well, she didn't ask that. But I say, whatever you do, do it in love. She is completely exonerated, as far as I'm concerned. She is going to be applied the principle. So I tell you, I acquaint you with a principle. And leave you to your choice and its risk. She is fantastic in hearing what she wants to hear in the world of Caesar. But may I tell you, you can go beyond it and take it into the world of promise. If someone can say to you, I have a lavish, steady, dependable income, consistent with integrity and mutual benefit, and your ear is so sensitive that you can hear exactly what the other one says, there are two witnesses now, if two agree on earth about any request that they might make, that request will be granted by my Heavenly Father. Well, now that's a request. It doesn't limit it there. Could I say to you, I have had the experience. I have had the experience of which he speaks, the experience of the resurrection and the birth from above. The experience of the discovery of the fatherhood of God. The experience of the ascent into the heavenly sphere. And can you hear with me that, because what I said before was as much a lie based upon this level as the other. And so I am telling you now of another level. Can you find agreement on this level? Where I will tell you, if I told you on this level, that my neighbors are gone, and now I am free of that disturbance, and you heard it with me. You heard my voice, you listened to my voice, and then having heard my voice distinctly, you now, in my absence, you hear my voice actually state what you heard it state physically. And here was two agreeing. You heard the voice. And now you heard this. Now can you go into another level and have someone who really sincerely desires to have the spiritual experience of the promise as that lad wanted to be free of a disturbing neighbor. And so, so the parents are dead. They've been killed on some freeway accident. Now you may say, did she do it? No, she didn't do it. She only heard, may I tell you, we are one body, there's only one spirit, only one Lord, only one God and Father of all. All things by a law divine in one another being mingled. We're only one. So if these two parents are now gone from the world, leaving behind these little children, two little dots in their swing, they're totally unaware that their parents are gone. And the other one, the early teens, he is a little bit, well, demented. And he is not quite aware of what has happened. So I say to you, I am telling you of a principle, a law that cannot fail. You don't have to do anything on the outside. And you don't even need another one. You can say it to yourself and then listen. The two could be within yourself. It need not be someone as sensitive as she is to the human voice. She has been trained that way. She was in the telephone 
business for quite a while as the head of her department on long distance calls and she knew voice after voice after voice and she could actually register that voice so she knew these voices that before you could even announce who you are she knew who you were because she knew the voice so she's been so trained to hear sound and so you come to her and she asks you to simply state it in a bold positive manner what you have which is really what you hope to have I hope to have it, don't state it as a hope, state it as a fact, because we're living in an imaginal world. This world is one's own imagination pushed out. The whole vast world is all imagination. That all these so-called objective realities are simply first imagined, and then they become well, what you and I call reality. So here, all things are possible to him who believes. And with God, all things are possible. Therefore, the human imagination is equated with God. God and the human imagination are one. And now tonight she is faced with this, and I try to persuade her today, she didn't do a thing that was wrong. You are telling a principle, you are exercising a law, but not until man is incorporated into the body of love will he actually be able to exercise this power where he can stop time and then start time because what horrors he would do in the world the two parents are gone or I saw they're gone they go all the time anyway but here the little man who wanted freedom from the disturbance of what we call a disturbing neighbor. The three little children playing all the time and disturbed him. So he didn't want that. And she was, didn't ask reasons beyond. She simply got his request. It is perfectly all right. Perfectly normal. Because she's a delightful, lovely lady. A lady who would not for one moment hurt anyone. But her whole interest has been on, well, the world of Caesar. Getting security. Dollars and cents. The promise does not interest her. As far as I'm concerned, it has not interested her. I can't see any interest in the promise when I talk to her. But I can see a great interest in the law. And she has discovered the law, and she works it beautifully. I have another friend of mine back in the East, and the promise means nothing to her. But the law does, and she has made millions. But millions. When you own buildings on 57th Street between 5th and 6th, you are in the money. When you have businesses all over the world, you are in big business, and that's her business. And she started with not one penny in this world when she first heard me. But she believed what I told her. She believed that imagining creates reality. As I'm telling you now, it does. It does create reality. So here, treat it, may I tell you, and I plead with you, treat it lovingly. If someone asks of you this night to hear good news for them, certainly hear it. But try to find out something behind the reason why they're asking it of you. That you may do it in a loving way. That whole family could have been removed without the destruction of the parents. It could have been removed by a thousand different ways, but it was removed in that manner. So, I tell you, your own wonderful human imagination is the only cause of the phenomena of life. There is no other power. That is the God spoken of in Scripture. That is the only God. Your own wonderful human imagination. Do you know what you want tonight? All right. Don't minimize it. It doesn't matter how big it is. State it. And then listen in your own wonderful manner, to your own voice for that matter, or tell a friend without his knowledge. You can hear a friend of yours tell you that he heard the good news about you. You know what you want. 
you actually write it out in your mind's eye and then have a friend whose voice you know well and listen to his voice and he is confirming that you have it. These are the two who agree. You don't need another's voice in the sense that let him come into your world as she did and have him first state what he wants. The professor didn't do that. He did it all within himself. He said, I have a lavish, steady, dependable income, consistent with integrity and mutual benefit. He didn't ask another to state that. He did it unto himself, and he became the two. So I don't need any of them to do it. If I have a desire to help you, or to help anyone, all I need to do is simply to imagine that I have heard them, and then I actually hear them tell me what I wish they would tell me. Then they are two. This one that I am hearing, and I am the one who is listening and hearing. And these two agree. And if two agree in testimony, then it is conclusive. And because imagining creates reality, it must externalize itself in my world. The whole vast world is only the imaginal act pushed out. And so we are told, with God, all things are possible. And all things are possible to him who believes. Well, am I not equating God with the believing one? And the believing one is that one's own wonderful human imagination. That's all that it is. Well, you put it to the test, and you can go to any extreme in this world. There is no limit set upon this principle, but none whatsoever. I can find one limit in Scripture, whether it be a violent thing or a lovely pleasant thing. There is no limit. I kill, I make alive. I wound, I heal. I do all things. And none can deliver out of my hand as I am told in the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. And I do everything. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. So you be the judge. I am telling you from my own personal experience that only when you are incorporated into the body of love will you exercise the power that can stop and release time. If you could stop time without love, what a horror you could create in this world. But you will not for one moment exercise that power until you are first incorporated into the body of love. So I say to this lady, she's not here tonight, a friend of hers is here tonight, who will see her. She did not do one thing that was wrong. She simply accepted the person's request, and she heard it distinctly, and in a matter of days, they're gone, rubbed out, leaving behind three little children. Now I tell you, if we were not one, it would be entirely different, but it was only done to herself. Because all things by a law divine in one another's being mingled. We're all one. And the day will come that everyone will know it. That's why I've been trying night after night to convince everyone who is here. <clears throat> that you one day will discover you are actually, literally, God the Father. The central theme of the Christian faith is the fatherhood of God. That's the central theme. And one day you will discover from your own experience that you are God the Father. And there is no power in the world that can persuade you that you are until a son and because he is father, there must be a son, and it is his son who stands before you and calls you father. Here, 
in Scripture. <clears throat> you are told, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And people wonder, what on earth is that all about? If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. A demented king stands and he looks at the head of the enemy of Israel and he wonders who is the father of the man who brought that head here. The king's name is Saul and he is insane and he asks his lieutenant Abner Abner, whose son is that you? And Abner said, as your soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. He said, inquire whose son the scripture is. No one knows. So the scripture, the young lad comes holding the head of the giant in his hand. And the king said to him, whose son are you, young man? And he said, I am the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Because the king had sworn to set the father, not the son, to set the father of the man who destroyed the enemy of Israel. And he destroyed the enemy of Israel. He would not put on the garment of the king. He took it off. He only carried five stones with him. There were five stones. This is all beautiful imagery. Five is simply grace. The number five is grace. And grace is God's gift of himself to man. So he took only the grace of God the gift of God, and grace is equated with power of God. For my grace is sufficient unto thee, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So you are the little weak one, you go forward, and you have my grace, you have my power. Not five little stones as told in the story. Here is God's gift of himself to man. So he stands before him, and the king does not understand who is standing before him. He is suffering from amnesia. The king is everyone in this world. He doesn't recognize his own son. Paul's first name was Saul. And Saul was converted into Paul. When he was Saul, he went out to destroy the entire story as he heard it. And then he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then he answered, Who are you, Lord? I am he whom thou persecutest. I am the Lord. And then he changed his name from Saul to Paul. The whole vast world is Saul. He looked into the face of his own son and he cannot recognize it because he's actually suffering from amnesia. Then comes a complete return of memory and he remembers he's promised to set the father free of the man who destroys the enemy of Israel. And so memory returns and he is the father, and he is set free. For no one can set me free but the son that I have forgotten. So my son returns, and all of a sudden, I am set free. This is the story of scripture. The day will come, you will actually see him. He will be one who will stand before you, you will recognize him, you are known to be your son, and knowing your scripture, that he is the son, the only son of God, and then he is your son,
then you know who you are. You are God himself. Limited for a little while in a garment of flesh and blood. To tell the story to encourage others who are still in the demented state of soul. Now, to go back to the story. If she could hear that which was not true, and that it becomes true, why limit it to the world of Caesar, of getting rid of a neighbor? Why limit it to dollars and cents of making a fortune? Why not take it into the promise and have someone within your own self say, I have experienced the promise. I have actually experienced the resurrection and the birth from above and the discovery of David and the ascension of myself into heaven and the descent of the dove. But then listen as though you actually heard it. If you can do it that way, well then take a friend. And hear a friend said you, I heard that you, and then let that friend's voice be the voice you're hearing. And you are reveling in what the friend is saying concerning what you have experienced. And have the two agree. And if the two agree in testimony, then it is conclusive. So do not limit it to the world of Caesar. So, when she called today at 10 this morning, I, my heart went out to her because she was quite, I was a quite disturbed, quite be disturbed, because she thought, what have I done? For I would not really, she would not kill, well, a butterfly. That's the kind of a lady that she is. She wouldn't hurt anyone. She wanted money, she has money. She really wanted that beyond all things, but she has it now. She got it, and for the rest of her early day or earthly days, that's done. It's all in trust, and she has it. Now I would ask her to go outside of that now. If she could only become hungry for it, as she was hungry for money. But do not dwell upon what has happened concerning the death of these two people. Forget it. They're gone in, from this little world, but they're still in a world just like this. And as far as the little children are concerned, they'll be taken care of. They'll go into this wonderful world of ours, and everything will be perfect. But I'm telling you, your own wonderful human imagination is creating all the realities of your world. All the objective things in the world about the outpouring of your imaginal acts. That's what Yeats meant when he said, I will never be certain it was not some woman treading in the wine press who started the subtle change in men's lives. For that, it was not some little shepherd boy lighting up his eyes for one moment before this little power ran upon its way. He was dreaming of being a hero. And he simply, in his own strange way, he dreams of violence. Because today it seems that man feels only if he is a hero in a military sense, that he really is a hero. He must be this, that, or the other in some fantastic manner. Well, he does it. And then he's influencing the entire world because we're all one. All things by a law divine in one another being mingled. We're all actually one. If I stand here now and lose myself in an imaginal act, I am influencing the entire world, influencing everyone who can be used to aid me in the objectification of what I'm imagining. So do it lovingly. Whatever you do, do lovingly. I don't care what it is. And if you are ever in doubt, do the loving thing, which is called by the simple, simple term, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So if you're ever in doubt, use that as your rule, and you can't go wrong. And then the day will come that you and I will meet on high. Then you'll be able to understand scripture. But here is the one who said, 
I am from above, and you are from below. I am not of this world. You are of this world. Do you think one man is talking to men? No. It is one being speaking to himself. Here is this outer man, called Neville, that came into the world first. This is the Esau of Scripture. And then after that comes another one, my own wonderful human imagination, and that's the Jacob. This is the twin that comes into the world. They aren't two separate little boys. This is the story. This is an adumbration of that which comes later into the New Testament. That the one who could say, I am from above, and you are from below. You are of this world. I am not of this world. So the being speaking is your own wonderful human imagination who in scripture is called Jesus Christ. And the thing below is the body that you're wearing. And that is of this world. Now, you are anchored here. I'll show you how I need not be anchored here. Because these two, as you're told in scripture, in thy limbs are nations twain. Rival races from their birth. One the mastery shall gain. The younger or the elder reign. That's the 25th chapter of the book of Genesis. Now, we are told in the first chapter, or the, the first book of Corinthians, the 15th chapter, that the second man is the Lord from heaven. So the second one, which was mentioned in Genesis as Jacob, who became Israel as he wrestled successfully with the Lord, and his name was changed from Jacob into Israel. He is that second man. He came second. Esau came first. Well, this is the Esau. And it's limited to its senses. It can only accept as true what the senses dictate, what reason allows. But there's something outside, far beyond this which is the second man, and he is the Lord from heaven. And he is called in scripture the Lord Jesus Christ. So here I stand here, I only accept as real what my senses now dictate, the room. But I don't want to be here. Is there something in me that could dominate this little man that insists that this is the only reality? Well, certainly it's my own wonderful human imagination. Can I, while standing here, assume that I am elsewhere and see the world from that elsewhereness and see it as I am now seeing this from this platform? I can do it. Well, if I do it, what would happen? I'd go there. Man not knowing that. He is tied to his little body of Esau, morning, noon, and night. He never gets away from it. But these rivals will in man. But the second one eventually will become superior. Their rival races from their birth. Yet that younger one is destined to be the master. And the younger, which is the second, is the Lord from heaven. And he will actually dominate when he becomes awake within this wonderful story that is scripture. And that second one is your own wonderful human imagination. So I will stand here and reason denies it, my senses deny it, my pocket book will not allow it, my time will not allow it. I want to go elsewhere. And everything in this world tells me I can't go. But where would I go? Well, I know exactly where I would go. Well, now, let me in my imagination go. I don't travel. I bring there here. And here vanishes. I take there and make it here. And I take then and make it now. And with my eyes close to this world, I simply envelop myself in my wish fulfilled. And see the world as I would see it if it were physically true. And when it seems to take on all the tones of reality, 
and all the sensory business of reality. Then I open my eyes and this world returns. That's what you're told in the book of Genesis. Esau came back from the hunt and Jacob, as he came back, Jacob vanished. But his father Isaac said, even though he deceived me into believing, he was you. I cannot take away my blessing. I gave him my blessing. I gave him your birthright, and I cannot take it back. I gave him the right of birth to come into this world and be as real as you seemingly are. So now you must vanish. And he must take it, even though he deceived me. It was a self-deception. I deceived myself into believing that I am what one moment before reason denied and my senses denied. Try it. And if it proves itself in performance, does it really matter what the world thinks? Because here we are dealing with the most fantastic mystery in the world. The mystery of imagining. That's what Fawcett said. The secret of imagining is the greatest of all problems to the solution of which every man should aspire. For supreme power, supreme wisdom, supreme delight lie in the far off solution of this mystery. Because you're actually solving the problem of God. If you can solve the problem of imagining, you're solving the problem of God. And so even though you make a mistake and people are injured, and tonight you are dead, no regret, they are awake in a world just like this to continue their journey and the three will be taken care of. So I do not stand in judgment. And no one to stand in judgment of what she did. She exercised a law that she heard. She heard it from me. I only ask you, when you hear it, mix it with love. Never do unto another what you would not want them to do unto you. Never do it. And so ask, why do you want the neighbors to go? All right. They will go in their own wonderful way. They will want to go without violence. They'll want to go. And you hear it in that way. So make them rearrange their words to fit a pattern of love. Then you hear that too. And it will all come to pass. Now let us go into the sun. Are there any questions, please? My dear, I will go along with that to a degree, but when I spoke what I did tonight from the 18th chapter, the 19th verse of Matthew, I cannot limit it. There is no limit placed upon that statement whatsoever. None. I cannot see where there's any limit on it. But if two agree on earth, about any request that they may want. That request will be granted by my Heavenly Father. No. He didn't say the request had to be in the world of Caesar. But he does state in Scripture, man isn't hungry for that request. I've had so many people in my world, many of them are gone now, Oh, Neville, there's coming up for that. 
time enough for that. It started back in 1925 in London, where a friend of mine, and he was only a few months older than I at the time, his name was, was Matthew Bakley. His parents were Scottish. And I said, aren't you interested, Matthew, in the things that your father is interested in? Because he was, the father was interested in psychism. But at least it was a beginning. Uh, an interest uh, of that nature would take you into something other. And he said, oh no, dad is an old man. Well, his father was then, I would say, 50, and he was then my age, which was 20, 1925. And his father was an old, old folk as far as he was concerned. And so was his mother, beautiful, lovely lady, I would say, in her mid-forties. And he said, no, I have time enough for that. Well, I came back to New York City. He went off to India as a tea taster, contracted some malaria and died. He didn't reach 21. Yet he had all the time in the world. And his father and mother, who he thought were all fogies, they remained in this world for years and years beyond that. In fact, during the last or the Second World War, knowing that they couldn't get sugar and couldn't get fats and things of that sort, I had my family in Barbados ship them sugar and fats and things of that nature. So that these would have something. They got every third par uh, parcel because the people at the post office and others seeing these things coming through, they themselves took it. But at least I could ship enough order to get through one in three. But Matt, all of a sudden, Matt died. And he wasn't 21. And he thought he had eternity before he could become interested in things of this nature. Matthew Bakley was his name. So let no one tell you for one moment you have eternity. No, do it now. But the hunger must be upon you. He was young naturally. 20 years old, with all the fire moving through him, but I was 22. I was 20 years old, and a few months younger than he was. He was about six months my senior. And I too had all the sap of life flowing through me, but there was a, something aroused within me, a hunger for the spirit world. Well, until it is upon you, as you're told in Scripture, I will send a famine upon the world. There will not be a hunger, for bread, or a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the word of God. So, what I told you tonight, the average person wouldn't show any interest whatsoever in listening to this. They want something entirely different. That's why I can tell you, don't limit that statement of the 18th chapter, the 19th verse of Matthew, to the world of Caesar. Did it work here? and he doesn't put a limit upon it, it certainly should work concerning the promise. Yes, sir? Well, this is my first time here. I'm not quite sure. I wasn't thinking about the world of the future of the world of time. Well, the world of Caesar is this world. The material world. And the world of the promise, he promises a new age which can only take place with us if we are born again. Not reincarnation. The word is anothin. You must be born from above. Unless you are born from above, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. 